Good morning out there in Facebook land. Uh, my name is John Miller. I'm the executive director here for the Shippensburg Historical Society. And I know that things are a little crazy right now um, with all of our programming pretty much being canceled until further notice. I figured, you know what, this is a good time for me to bring out a program that actually was developed by the National Park Service called Coffee with a Ranger. And since I'm no longer a ranger, I'm calling it Coffee with a Historian. So as you can see, I got my mug of coffee here with my favorite sports team, even though that's been heavily affected, but hey, we got to do what we got to do to get through the times. Now, aside from history as far as like the Civil War or the French Indian War, um, material culture that I've been interested in for more than 20 years. I've also been interested in the history of music, um, whether it be the history of musical instruments, country music, um, even the, uh, the family tree of heavy metal. It doesn't really matter. I love all types of music. And in order to understand how I listen to music, I also had to kind of do some research on the history of playback. Because as I've entered my 43rd year of life, I've seen a lot of trends come and go. I've also seen old trends actually come back in a huge way. I never thought I would see vinyl records and cassette tapes um, being so popular as what they are getting to um, with regards to today. So, I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about the history of recording and playback. And it's because of the fact that ever since the earliest form of human history, music has always been the center of that community. And in some ways, it's actually pretty much, for the most part, it was their version of social media. The one-on-one -on -one interaction, um, making different sounds and rhythms and beats, um, to the point where you would go from maybe sticks and stones to make different kinds of sounds to more traditional string instruments or even uh, air balloon instruments. Either way, Music has always been around. And we know that because the oldest form of hand-carved or hand-written music sheets actually date back to 1400 BC. It would take 1,073 years later in the AD to where sheet music was actually first printed using a real printing press. So there was always a need to preserve music. You get into the classical era from 1730 to 1820, and what a lot of these composers like Beethoven and Bach did was they basically took the root of the music of ancient Egypt, and they gave it like a Western culture touch to it, because of the fact that they improved on music during medieval and Renaissance era, and what they do is they establish the classical era and because of that, a lot of the norm, the, the, how music is written as far as composition, these guys set the standard for. It. And it doesn't matter if you're into, it doesn't matter what style of music you're into, if it wasn't for these guys establishing the norm, we wouldn't have nearly half of what we have. Just like with the development of the blues before the uh, 1900s, if you wouldn't have the blues, you wouldn't have rock and roll. You would have half a country and so on and so forth. Really, we got to thank these guys over in Europe for what they contributed. And what's interesting is that some of the first recorded history of music that you can play start with music sheets that these individuals composed. So if you wanted to hear what Bach or Beethoven wrote, as long as you learn know how to read music, and play an instrument, you can pretty much interpret that. But then you get into the mid-1800s, especially before the eve of our American Civil War. And there were actually inventors out there who wanted to basically figure out how they can record sounds, 
The problem was is that the technology for playback wasn't around. And this French inventor by the name of Martinville, he basically invented the first sounds or recorded the first sounds using basically what we would call carbon paper. Some of his recordings go back as far as you know, the mid-1850s. But to show you how far he progressed, I'm going to play you a sample from 1860, just on the eve of our American Civil War. <laughs> clearly hear it's noisy, it's very scratchy, kind of sounds eerie in some ways, but he actually achieved a recording. The technology to play back, like I said, wasn't available in the 1850s or 60s. So a lot of his experiments um, wouldn't come to bear fruit until, you know, in the 2000s when some of his recordings were actually found in an organization by the name of First Sounds were actually able to play what he recorded back. So this guy here, Martinville, he basically is going to revolutionize or kind of start the revolution for sound. Because 17 years after that sample I, I, I let you guys listen to, Thomas Edison in 1877 invented the phonograph. The phonograph basically took wax cylinders and he put them on a machine and it would record coming to them this way. The problem is, is that the recording is very scratchy. So it was technology at its best, but this is going to set off a chain of events for better quality of sound and production. The wax cylinders held about two minutes of music. Um, they had to be recorded in a warm environment because you have to take a needle and cut into the wax. But then, in 1887, Berliner, who basically he invents what's called a gramophone, in which flat discs are going to be used to be played upon. And at first, some of these uh, flat discs were made of hard rubber and shellac. But the record was the first sound record, uh, recording that was in mass production in 1900. And by 1921, more than 106 million records were being sold in this country yearly. That's pretty impressive. And these machines right here... It didn't matter if you lived in the south, it didn't matter if you lived in the north, on the western plains, it didn't matter if you lived in Appalachia. There's a lot of photographic evidence going back into, especially the 1920s, that shows um, some of the more poorest or the lower class people, especially where I come from in Appalachia, and this technology here made their lives total difference. But then comes the birth of the album, and that, of course, you know, the Shellac Records, they only hold about four or five minutes worth of sound. Artists wanted to record more than just two songs. So the photo album, or in this case, the record album, came about. Taking the idea of the photo album, but making sleeves to put records into, that is where the term album comes from. But then you get into 1948, and that was the year that the LP was born. That's right, this lovable, round, vinyl disc that we call a record or an LP was born. And this became the standard, and that standard is in use even to this day. Now, some of the equipment that you can buy today will allow you to play the 78 records, which means you can have at your fingertips, if you go into an antique store, you can have 
a record that's almost 100 years old, or even over 100 years old, he can still play that back. So in that sense, records have been with us for more than a century, but the standard as we know it was born in 1948. And of course, each side held about well, 22 minutes worth of music. Now, interesting to note, see the gentleman holding a stack of records right here. Those are all LPs. You see that large stack of records. That right there, that is the uh, record album. The select records I was telling you about. You can take that whole pile and condense it down to exactly what he's holding with one of these. Or through these. Well, then you get into 1949, and of course, the 45 record was born. Now, the 45 record actually had a better sound because of the fact that grooves are a little bit uh, thinner and it spins a lot faster. Just like the 78s that were made out of vinyl that were in the shape of a 45. Some of those that are called micro grooves, those had an astounding quality to them. Clear, crisp. You couldn't even get a CD to sound that good. But the 45s, they had a better sound quality than the standard 33 and a third. And because of that, it almost replaced the LP. What I like about the 45 is that I have to laugh at it because of the fact that it only really holds so much recording to it. So if you can imagine listening to a 17 minute song like Iron Butterflies in Agata Vivita. Okay, it's a 17 minute song. A 45, we'll just say it holds about five minutes worth of music per song. You would have to listen to the first five minutes, flip over, that brings you to 10 minutes, put another record in, listen to that for five minutes, and then flip that record over to complete the last two minutes of it. Or you can just listen to the single version that came out to just under three minutes. But if you did that, you lose that 10 minute drum solo. And, uh, and that's what makes Inagata Vita sound so great, is that drum solo. At the same time that records were becoming popular, so was magnetic tape. And the origins of that tape go back to the 1920s, but it was made available here in this country in the 1940s. The problem with magnetic tape is that in order to get a good quality sound, you have to have a lot of it because it has to be wide and it has to basically spin at a very fast rate. But then uh, to cut the expense out of it, what a lot of record companies did is they took that tape and they would go ahead and set a quarter inch tape, they would cut it in half. And then you had to accommodate for left and right speakers. And by the time you did that and slowed it down, you lost a lot of the sound quality out of it. So reel to reel at first was really good, but by the time you get into the 80s, you lost a lot of the sound quality that went with it. Well, in 1958, RCA decided that they were going to go ahead and invent what was called the sound tape cartridge. It was discontinued shortly after its introduction. The thing with tape like this was because of the fact that more and more women were working as secretaries, in more and more meetings, a lot of the men would basically record the meetings and then have the secretaries transcribe that meeting. So that was what was important about these tapes. They would hold about 30 minutes of basically sound per side. So you can see the difference between the sound tape cartridge compared to the average cassette tape. And that brings us to the cassette tape itself. It was invented in 1962 by Philips Company, introduced in this country in 1964. It contained about 20 to 30 minutes of music or recording um, per side. It became very popular in the 1970s. And of course, because of how noisy tape is, because of the fact that you have type one, two, and four, 
stereos were adapted with the Dolby system. That way it would automatically help to reduce that noise. The problem with this adorable cassette tape, which was small, held in a plastic case, convenient because when you're done with it, you didn't want to listen to it, you would put it in its spot, or in my case as a teenager, I had jacket pockets, and I would put it there. But the popularity of the cassette tape began declining in the early 1900s, and by 2000 it was pretty much phased out. And as I said, a lot of people say that cassettes were bad, some of them really loved them, some of them said that it was because they were too noisy, they weren't as clear as what records were. That's because for the most part you had type 1, which is normal, that's the cheapest. Type 2 was kind of like the medium grade. Type 4, because of the fact that it had metal in it, is the most expensive. So. When you're going out to buy a cassette tape, what do you think the record companies are going to use to produce on? Are they going to use Type 1, Type 2, or Type 4? And this one here, of course, this is actually Type 2. So, it's pretty much medium. But then, you also had the A track. Here's my copy of ACDC Back in Black. Now, I have to admit, I am old enough to actually play these um, in my stereo system. I can remember going to school with my good friend who had a 70s pickup truck, and the only thing he had was an 8-track player. So, of course, you know, he had whatever the uh, cartridges that were left from his parents that he, we would listen to. ACDC was among one of them. But the 8-track cartridge was created in 1964. It started out with an invention to play in your car because you can't play records in a car. But then by the late 60s, sound systems began to allow these cartridges to be played in the house. These things really became popular for a very short period of time. Now, what is 8-track? What does that mean? Well, you got the tape that's right here. It's a quarter-inch tape which was broken down into four programs. Those were called your songs. But then, to make up for the fact that you had left and right speakers, they had to be broken down in half again. And that's how 8-track basically got its name. Pre-recorded 8-tracks can hold an album of about 46 minutes of music or 11.5 uh, minutes per track. It was actually meant to replace the LP. But by 1982, most music stores stopped selling these little cartridges because they're not as popular. Now, some of the artists like Bruce Springsteen and, of course, Madonna, they still produced records on the 8 track all the way up to the eve of the uh, 1990s. So, I don't think 8-track is going to be making a comeback anytime soon. The thing that I used to really um, dislike about these was the fact that I would try to learn how to play a song on a guitar. And if I was trying to figure out what chords are being played, for example, in a chorus, you couldn't rewind. You had to fast forward through all those tracks until you got back to the song. Or you kept getting the adapter to finally take it back. But then, the age of the CD came out. And this is a digital optical disk data storage format. And it was developed and released in 1982. This CD can hold 80 minutes worth of music. Its high watermark was from 1988 to 1992. And of course, it surpassed the sales of records and cassettes. By early 2000, the CD began to decline in popularity because of downloading. Now, I have to admit, I probably started buying CDs 
probably about 1993, 94, because of the fact that why pay $17 for this in this long cardboard um, um, boxes when you can buy this for like $8. So I pretty much was one of the last holdouts on that. But I got tired of having all my collection on cassette and then as over time I'll go ahead and buy that same collection on this. And even to this day I am going back and rebuying those collections on LP because I got rid of my LPs a long time ago. So digital music, which was developed in the late 1980s, it became more accessible in 1992. And of course, by 1999, digital uh, music downloading pretty much enjoyed its popularity. But then in 2003, paid downloading services were being established. How many of you out there remember when Metallica's drummer, Lars, sued Napster? In 2008, ironically, Digital download began to decrease in sales because of streaming services. Now, I have to admit, I was not a fan of streaming services. The Zoom player right there, up until about one month ago, I carried that thing with me all the time. The down, the down to that is, is that one time I dropped it, I lost all my music. So out of 14,000 songs, I had to go ahead and go through all those CDs, put them back on, which is a process in its half because you have to burn them to your computer and then upload them. Then all the music that I did buy off the internet, I had to go back through and re-download all that. So recently, after my Zoom player failed, I just got tired of it. So I went ahead and just like everybody else, went to a streaming service, which was introduced in 2002. By 2005, the streaming services really began popularity. 2008 was a tipping point because you had better quality and more artists who were willing to go ahead and have their music put on a streaming service site. So today, I listen to this, Spotify. The problem with all of this it's convenient. I will give it that. But you don't own the music. You're basically you're renting it. Because of that, and because of the decline of the CD, analog ways of listening to music, such as stereos, and the analog technology itself, such as records, and to a smaller extent, cassette tapes, are making a huge comeback. Now there's a several theories about that. It could be because of the uh, nostalgia to it. it. Could be the fact that people actually want to hold the actual copy in their hand that way they can say they own it. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that more and more people are taking a liking to it. You know, whereas with digital music, you can't hold it. Whereas with the physical copy, you can hold it. Germany began mass production in 2018 on real to real machines, which I never saw that coming. In 2008, Vinyl Records, for the first time since 1986, have outsold CDs. And of course, cassette sales are up as well. In 2018, more than 219,000 of these units were sold. This trend has been going up and up and up since 2014. Why is that? Well, it costs millions to make a record. A lot of the smaller and up-and-coming musicians and bands, um, artists, what they're doing is they want to get their music out to the people, but they don't have the support of major record companies. So there's a whole underground scene right now where a lot of the the lesser known bands, in order to get their music out, they're converting back to CD as one format, cassette, and in some cases, they're actually putting their music on records. And the reason being is because they want to give options to their fans.
pants. There's nothing wrong with options. I like options. But because of the analog types of you know, music, that means vintage stereos are also making a comeback as well. I have to admit, you know, I had a heck of a good stereo when I was growing up as a teenager. Got rid of it. Um, last year, I ended up getting one from back in the 1990s. Because I think the sound quality of these uh, machines sounds so much better than what's being produced today. And because of that and the trends, there's something that's really awesome happening here. We've come full circle. So if you look here, you got Frank Squire's Music Store in 1921. And I now put Main Street on it, but it's actually East King Street. But look at the photograph with all the Shellac records. Compare that to the music store that's making a comeback today. Isn't this awesome? So some of my favorite obsolete media forms that I never had, but I've studied them. Um, the four track, the play track, or excuse me, the play tape. Teflon, which is this little device up here. And of course, who remembers the cassette adapters? You know, most cars in the 80s and 90s had cassette decks. And of course, you know, I had a, basically a CD version of a Walkman. So I would put that in there, but I wanted to play with my uh, CDs. Go ahead and use that adapter right there. Just plug in to the basically the headphone side. You put the tape into the tape deck and you can play any CD you want. The downside to it is if you hit a bump, the CD would skip all over the place. But check out some of these obsolete forms of media by going to obsoletemedia.org. It's an excellent website. Um, check out uh, firstsounds.org as well. They're the ones who rec uh, basically took those first recordings of the 1800s and they put them in a format to where you can listen to them. With that being said, and with my coffee here, I just want to thank you for watching. And just like you, I know we'll get through this. And if you like this, maybe we'll do more of these in the future. Until then, folks, here's to you.